Fitzgerald in My Freshman Husband on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. But first, here is Ted Pearson with some timely information. Uh, from now on, you'll be spending more time out of doors on the beaches, the tennis courts, or sunbathing in your backyard. In many cases, your hair will suffer from overdoses of sun and water. Well, as an aid to more manageable hair, a hair that will glisten with that cared-for look, select a comb made by DuPont. More completely desirable, DuPont plastic combs offer unusual sturdiness combined with crystal carnival colors that lend a cheerful note to any pocket, purse, or dressing table. These smartly styled plastic combs, suitable for every personal and family purpose, are worthy additions to the DuPont Company's Better Things for Better Living through chemistry. The DuPont Company presents My Freshman Husband, starring Geraldine Fitzgerald as Jane Spencer and featuring Richard Whitmark as Russ on The Cavalcade of America. It is early September in a small American city. Russ Spencer, recently discharged from the Army, is enjoying the novel experience of helping his pretty young wife give their son his morning bath. No, no, Ricky. You must not put the soap in your mouth. Mm -mm, no good. Hey, does he put everything in his mouth? Oh, no. Just soap, sand, buttons, paper, and... Holy oh, match. Maybe he's not getting enough to eat. Oh, now, Russ, does he look it? No, sir. Just look at that build on him. Feel the muscles in those arms. Why, someday he's going to be stroke on a Yale crew, aren't you, fella? <laughs> Honestly, if I can get him through his teething stage, I don't care if he goes to college or not. Well, I do. He's not going to be an ignoramus like his old man. Mr. Spencer... You're speaking of the old man I love. Mm. Hand me the towel, Don. Well, honey, if we're talking about the same guy, it looks as if you'll never get any farther than Sloan's Emporium. Imagine a girl with your background, your education, married to a chump like me. Oh, Russ, the Emporium is just your jumping-off place. You're not going back there. I'm not going to let you. Oh, but honey... Russ, before we were married, remember those things you used to say about studying journalism and getting a job in a newspaper? Pipe dreams, Janie. How in heck can I study journalism? By going to college. College? You could start in two weeks with the summer course. Oh, my gosh, Jane. If you're thinking about that G.I. Bill of Rights... It's a business... wonderful plan. Russ, the government pays your tuition and gives you money for living expenses. Yeah, but, honey, it'd mean living on an allotment again and only $75 for the three of us. Oh, darling. I've learned to stretch a shoestring so far, you'd think it was made of rubber. Yeah, but the baby... The college campus is a wonderful place to bring up a baby. <laughs> He'll probably grow up to be a quiz kid. Oh, now, honey, let's be sensible. I can't start going to college at my age. You realize how old I am? I'm 25. <laughs> and I'm an old hag of 21. <laughs> oh, darling, you're no older than lots of the other GIs at Buckley University. Buckley, huh? Yeah. I know you've always had a warm feeling for Buckley, and they're accepting GI students now. Mm. Darling, the 1031 train gets you there at noon, and you can go and see the dean or the president or whoever it is. Why don't you go right now, dear? Here's your hat. You can just make it. Hey, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, Janie. What about you and Ricky? We need a place to live. Darling, for a chance like that, I'd be willing to set up house in a chemistry lab and cook our meals on Bunsen burners. Where is it? I want to see it right away. Janie, I'm warning you, you'll be disappointed. Is this our door? Yeah. Oh, Russ. It's darling. Come the way you described it, I thought you'd be living in a converted broom closet. So it's a converted attic. With a private stove. Look, two burners. Mm. Oh, and that wonderful big window. Russ, come and look. You can see the campus from here. Where? Mmm, just smell those lilacs. I'm going to ask Mrs. Simmons if I can use a corner of the backyard for a vegetable garden. On $75 a month, it's smart to grow your own food. Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, uh, say, honey, about that allotment. Mm -hmm. The fellas here tell me that sometimes it takes four months before that first check comes through. Well, we've got a little money saved up. But tell me about you, Russ. What's that? A closet? What courses are you taking? I wonder if there are any hangers around. What are your teachers like? What would you like for supper? <laughs> yes. Yes, what? Yes, I think you're wonderful, and I'm glad you're the mother of my child. <laughs> and I love you something awful. Oh, darling. If you knew how much I love you. How about frankfurters and sauerkraut? <laughs> Honey, you say the most romantic things. <laughs> Oh, 
gosh, honey, isn't it too much trouble to walk me to class every morning? No. Here, let me push it's the It's the one way I can get to the market before everything's sold and Ricky gets his air in. Hey, hey, he's putting something in his mouth. He's supposed to, darling. It's a piece of toast. Oh. What's your first class today? Trigonometry, worse luck here, Mr. Building. Why in heck does anyone who wants to be a journalist have to study trigonometry? Well, maybe someday an editor will send you to interview Dr. Einstein. Oh, no, sure. Well, I suppose the subject could be very interesting if it weren't for that professor, Dr. Baird. Hi, Professor. Oh, hello there. Hey, uh, how'd you make out in that trigonometry quiz yesterday? I'd rather not think about it. Oh, I thought it was a pipe. I finished it in ten minutes. Hey, come on, Jack. It's late. I'll be right with you. Well, I'll see you in class, Professor. Okay, Sonny. Sonny? Russ, you sound as if you were his grandfather. Well, honey, I feel like it. I didn't know freshmen came that young. They're all like that, just kids and smart. It's just that they're used to studying classrooms. They've been doing it right along without a break. Don't worry, darling. Once you get the hang of it, you'll catch up with them and pass them. Good morning, Spencer. Oh, good morning, Dr. Lewis. Well, is this your family? Yes, sir. Dr. Lewis, my wife, Jane, my son, Ricky. How do you do? I'm very glad to know you. I want to tell you how much charm you add to our austere campus. Why, thank you. Yes, these past weeks, with all the young wives and babies around, Buckley University has lost that, well, that ivory tower look. (laughs) You young people remind old fossils like me that education is a, a preparation for life. Not an end in itself. Well, we think it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> I don't know what makes you think you're an old fossil. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Well, I must be getting along to my class. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Lewis. Good morning. He's as sweet as he can be. Yeah, he's a swell guy. He's my English lit professor. Now, if I had somebody like him for trigonometry instead of Dr. Baird... Say, what's wrong with this Dr. Baird? Oh, he's such an old... Uh-oh, here he comes. Good morning, Dr. Baird. Morning. Uh, did you get the quiz paper I left on your desk? It might have been better for you if I hadn't. Russ, I think I see what you mean. Uh, uh, I'm uh, going to return your quiz papers of yesterday. A large percentage of them revealed an appalling inability to absorb even the most rudimentary elements of trigonometry. I should like to state at this time, for the special benefit of the veterans in the class, that I make no allowance for old age <laughs> or for the family problems which undoubtedly beset you. I have always maintained high and rigorous standards. You will either measure up to them or fall by the wayside. Hey, Spencer, he talks like he might have been a second lieutenant. Yeah, who never left his desk. Yeah, the old... Gentlemen, uh, if I may have your attention, you will recall that the first question on the quiz read as follows... From the top of a radio station 60 feet high, the angles of elevation and depression of the top and bottom of an aerial tower are 24 degrees, 10 minutes, and 38 degrees, 40 minutes, respectively. How high is the tower? The correct answer was very easily arrived at. All the necessary information was given. Uh, No, sir, it wasn't. Oh? Very well, ex-Corporal Shea. What vital fact was missing? The name of the radio station. (laughs) Ex-Corporal Shea. Unless you wish to be excused from this class permanently, you will apply what little concentration is at your command to the study of trigonometry and spare us any further samples of your rapier-like wit. Huh? You see a spool of green thread anywhere? Uh-uh. Hey, where'd you get the sewing machine? Borrowed it from Mrs. Simmons. Oh. What are you making? Rumpus for Ricky, out of one of your old shirts. <laughs> resourceful little female, aren't you? Darling, a really resourceful female would be making a shirt for you out of Ricky's old romper. Oh, no. Hey, uh, that reminds me, honey. Did we get any mail today? If you mean, did our first allotment check come yet, the answer is no. Nope. Mm. Well, uh, how are we doing in the cash on hand department? <laughs> I'm afraid that department has been discontinued. Mm-hmm. I wonder what happened to that school of green thread. Uh, uh, Janie. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- w- would you mind if I got a job for Saturday nights? Would you mind if I got a job Sunday morning? What are you talking about? Russ, if you can get excused from Sunday morning chapel and stay home with Ricky, I can get $2 for singing in the choir. What? And I can get $6 playing the piano with the band over at the Buckley Inn. $8 a week. Isn't much, darling, but but it'll keep Ricky and Milk or, or vice versa. Oh, but gee, Janie, there go the weekends. Oh, hey, I think he's got something in his mouth again. Oh, for goodness sakes. Here, Ricky, open your mouth. What have you got in there? You see it? Get it out. Come on. Let Mommy have it. Get it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, no wonder I couldn't find my spool of green thread. <laughs> The 
idiom for to mean? Uh, boo mm -hmm. How do you say to make use of? Uh, to serve a Right. Mm. What's the idiom for? You better wash this dish over again. It's still got egg on it. What? Oh, oh, okay. Hey, drill me on the next page, too, will you? The French midterm's going to cover everything up oh, to Oh, my goodness. Time. Look at the time. I'd better go and get dressed. What for? I've got a job for the afternoon, don't you remember? What? I'm fixing sandwiches at the Dean's Tea. Well, who's going to stay with Ricky? You are. Me? You don't have classes on Wednesday afternoon. But, honey, I'm taking my psychology midterm. It what? was switched from the regular time, didn't I tell you? No. Yeah. Oh, Russ. What'll we do? That Dean's tea job pays at least two dollars, and there's practically nothing left in the kitty, and no sign of that darn old chair. Yeah, yeah, I know, honey. Hey, uh, maybe we could leave Ricky with Mrs. Simmons no, for a few No, no, she hours, went huh? downtown. Oh, fine. Oh, that certainly leaves us in a mess. Russ, wait a minute. What? I've got an idea. What is it? You just put Ricky in the baby buggy and leave him outside your sight building. What? All you have to do is get a seat near the window and cast a glance at him once in a while. Oh, boy, that's a fine way to take an exam, worrying about your baby outside. There'll be nothing to worry about. He'll be perfectly fine and get his airing at the same time. You'll see. It'll work out beautifully. Will you have a sandwich, Dean Parker? Oh, thank you, my dear. Uh, are you the wife of one of our new students? Yes, sir. <laughs> and the mother of a future one. Well, that's very nice. Tell me, are you comfortably settled? Can we help you along in any way? Well... Yes, you can, Dean Parker. I've been thinking about it all afternoon. If the university could set up some sort of a, of a nursery where we could... Well, well, it sounds as if we're having a thunder shower. Mm, just listen to it come down. But, but about the nursery, you see, there are times when neither of us can stay home with the baby, and so we... Oh! Oh, my goodness, it's raining! Why, uh, uh, yes, oh, it is. Oh, my baby, my poor baby. Here, please take this sandwich train. Uh, yes, certainly, but you I... Russ is taking a psychology midterm, and I... No, I can't explain now. I've got to run. But, Miss, uh, I may be madam. Uh, what seems to be the trouble, Dean Parker? Well, as far as I can make out, Dr. Lewis, the young woman's baby is taking a midterm examination in psychology. Uh, have a sandwich. You have only ten more minutes, gentlemen, to finish the exam. Oh. Define a conditioned reflex and illustrate by describing a simple experiment. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that must be that dog and bell thing. Uh, excuse me for interrupting your class, Dr. Murdoch. <laughs> Why, Dr. Bear? I found this child sitting outside the building at the mercy of the elements. I concluded he must belong to one of the absent-minded students. Holy mackerel, Rick! Oh, is this your child, Spencer? The child seems to think so. Here, here, I'll, uh, I'll take him, Dr. Baird. Thanks a lot for bringing him in. In another few moments, he would have been thoroughly drenched. Some men are as unfit to be fathers as they are to be students. You are listening to My Freshman Husband, starring Geraldine Fitzgerald as Jane Spencer and featuring Richard Whitmark as Russ on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our second act opens, Russ, a G.I. freshman, is home, angrily describing the embarrassing events which forced him to finish the exam while balancing a gurgling baby on his lap. Can you imagine that so-and-so talking to me that way? What I can't imagine is he's been decent enough to bring Ricky inside in the first place. <laughs> anyway, you should have seen me trying to finish my test with Ricky chewing at the exam paper. <laughs> well, you know, he almost swallowed eight answers before I caught him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darling, you ought to write an article about the joys of being a freshman and a father at the same time. Well, boy, I certainly have plenty of material. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, Russ? What? You know, like those funny letters you used to write me about army life. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. Next week, when I have a little time. Oh, no, darling, do it right now. Next week, the typewriter may be in Hawks. Oh, darling, it's a swell article. <laughs> you really like it? I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Why don't you send it back home to the Millport Herald? Oh, no, Jane, it isn't good enough to get into print. Well, why not let them decide? Anyway, the best writers collect their rejection slips early. Yeah, that's true. Well, well, all right, I'll send it. What have I got to lose? Only a three-cent stamp. Uh, who's got three cents? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you suppose that is? I'll bet that's Mrs. Simmons again about the rent. Uh, Maybe if we keep quiet, she'll think we're not home. She's slipping something under the door. Probably the bill. Yeah. If we ignore it, do you think it'll go away? <laughs> Wait a minute. J. 
Janie. What is it? It's from Washington. What? Oh, Russ, it isn't the check. Yes, it is. Oh, let me see it. Let me look at it. Here. Let me hold it. Oh, darling, it's beautiful. Pay to the order of Russell Spencer, $75 and no cents. It's sheer poetry. That's oh. what it is. Now, if we don't buy clothes, don't go to the movies, don't get oh, sick. Oh, no, we won't. Russ, you ought to stop worrying about those things. That's my department. From now on, you're going to concentrate on your studies and nothing but. <laughs> Reflexes are the basis of most animal movements. Involuntary reflexes take place without our being conscious of them. More Daddy. No, not now, Ricky. Daddy's studying. More Daddy. Jane! Voluntary reflexes are those we can control at will. Such as... For heaven's sake, Ricky, go away, will you? Jane! 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 Measures presented to Congress for enactment are known as bills. When they are assigned to committees, they are numbered and thereafter referred to... Oh, for crying out loud. Janie, what's all that racket? I'll close the window, darling. Some of the boys on their way to the basketball game. Oh, is there a basketball game on tonight? The integral part of a logarithm is called the characteristic. The decimal part is called the mantissa. If the number whose logarithm is to be found is less than one, the characteristic is negative. The mantissa, however, is positive. The mantissa, however, is positive. Well, so am I. Positive that trigonometry is way over my head. Look, Janie, from where I sit now, I can't possibly get a passing mark in trig, and the finals are only two weeks away. Darling, I'm sunk. <laughs> But are you Ted Corey, the senior who wants someone to type a hundred-page thesis on higher mathematics? Yeah, that's right. Well, the student employment office gave me your name. I'll type it for you. Oh, that's fine. Uh, but I'm warning you, it's going to be a headache full of mathematical symbols, and they have to be copied exactly. Oh, I'll be very careful. Okay. Uh, what's the usual charge? Ten dollars, but uh, instead of paying me, would you mind coaching my husband in trigonometry? <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Have I got everything, honey? Pencils, eraser, protractor? Here, drink this orange juice. Oh, now. no, honey. I'm you can't take a three-hour exam on an empty stomach. Well, okay. I'm putting a bar of chocolate in your pocket. Uh, yeah, now, remember, yeah. darling, keep calm. Yeah, sure. There's nothing for you to be nervous about. No, I know. Ted Corey told me last night that he never saw anyone learn so much in two weeks. Well, I hope I don't forget it in one hour. Goodbye, Janie. Good luck, darling. We'll be rooting for you every... What's the matter with Ricky? Just... He's got something in his throat. Ricky, Ricky, spit it out, darling. Oh, right. What do we do? Oh, gee, Ricky. Oh, she's turning blue. He's choking to death. Russ, there's still time. Please go. There's nothing to be done here at the hospital. Well, how can I concentrate on taking a test when He's Ricky... It's going to be might... all right. The doctor said something large in his windpipe, and they're operating now to get it out. Now... Please, get over to that trig final. You're, uh, you're, you're sure everything will be all right? Positive. Good luck, darling. Thanks, honey. Ricky and I will be rooting for you. Jane? Janie, you home? Janie? But Ricky, Ricky, how, how's Ricky? He's was inside sleeping. They didn't have to operate after all. They got it out with a, with a magnet or something. Oh, <laughs> gosh, what a relief. Well, what was it, this thing he swallowed? Well, believe it or not, your discharge button. Oh, oh my gosh. Russ, how was the exam? Janie, it's no use. Hmm? I tried, but all I could think of was Ricky. I only finished half the questions. I don't belong in college, Janie. I ought to be working and providing for you and Ricky, giving you the kind of home and things you need. But Russ... It's no use, Jane. Just no use. All right, darling. Russ... Would you mind staying here with Ricky? Where are you going? I'll be back in a little while. I, uh, I need some things at the drugstore for Ricky. And I was sure, Dr. Baird, that once you knew why it happened, you'd agree to give Russ another examination. My dear Mrs. Spencer, what happens to your husband outside this classroom is not my concern. But Russ didn't finish the exam. 
That means you'll fail the course and be dropped from the university. Perhaps it's just as well. There are some people who don't belong in college. I guess there are, including teachers. I beg your pardon? Dr. Baird, veterans like my husband deserve all the help and encouragement we can give them. Things are tough enough for them here as it is. But the regular students so much younger, they feel stupid and old and out of place. And it isn't their fault. My husband and all the others gave three and four years of their lives. And we owe them a fair chance to make up what they missed. Heaven knows they've earned it. Just as they've earned the right to be treated with decent respect instead of... Instead of cold and deliberate hostility. Now, see here, young woman. I can't understand what makes you so cruel to people. Every student in Buckley thinks of you as a... As a heartless monster without a drop of human kindness. Hmm. And yet... I can't quite believe that. I can't believe it of a man who leaves his class to bring a baby in out of the rain. Oh, infants are helpless beings dependent upon us for everything. Well, right now, Russ is helpless and dependent on you in a much more important sense. All I'm asking is that you give Russ another examination. A different one. A harder one, if you think that's fair. But I suppose it's just our bad luck that you're the only professor on the campus who... Knowing the circumstances would still refuse. Good afternoon, Dr. Bear. Mrs. Spencer. Yes? Tell your husband to be here at 3 o'clock sharp this afternoon. But if his paper doesn't merit a passing grade, he won't get it. Please let him pass. Please let him pass. Janie, I passed. Oh, I passed. I made it. I'm good for another term. Oh, oh, darling. I told you you're a genius. No, sir. You're the genius in this family. Boy, I wish I knew what I'm so happy about. When I think of you living like this for another two years, hand to mouth. Oh, nothing... don't be silly, silly. I love every minute of it. Mm. What's that letter you're waving around your hand? Well, oh, this, Jim. Oh, God. Let me see it. Mrs. Simmons handed it to me on my way in. Russ. Hmm? It's from the Millport Herald. Yeah? Dear Mrs. Spencer, we apologize for the delay in acknowledging receipt of your article, Baby Goes to College. We found it most amusing and interesting. They did? And we enclosed a check for $15. What? Would you be willing to write two articles a month in the same vein at the same rate? Does it really say that? Oh, right. I'm so proud of you. Oh, boy, 30 bucks extra a You're month. You're a rich and famous writer already. Look, we'll use that money to buy you a new dress. Uh-huh. We'll get you a beautiful... <laughs> hey, where's that $15 check they mentioned? Haven't you got it? No. Oh, my goodness. Ruff, quick. Ricky's chewing it up. Oh, my God. Ricky, stop it. Let go. Open your mouth. Ricky! <laughs> Fitzgerald will return to our cavalcade microphone in a moment. Now here is Ted Pearson. Uh, Detroit, the dynamic center of the automobile industry, has just brought to a dramatic close a golden jubilee celebrating 50 years of motor cars. We're looking at the new cars side by side with the automobiles of half a century ago. It's easy to see what tremendous progress has been made and understand why American cars are the best in the world. Manufacturers do everything they can to make them the safest cars in the world. And other industries work to increase motoring safety. Other industries like the chemical industry. Uh, The DuPont Company, for instance, has contributed to the development of improved rayon cords and rubber chemicals for tires, case-hardening compounds for gears, reflectors of lucite acrylic resin for highway safety at night, and strong, flexible plastic interlayer for laminated safety glass. And still, there were 100,000 more deaths from accidents between Pearl Harbor and VJ Day than there were in the war. And a great many of them were motoring accidents. Accidents are on the increase, and there are several reasons why. One-fourth of all the cars on the road today are 11 years old or more. Some of them have been repaired with makeshift parts. Tires are recapped. Tubes have been patched and patched again. There are drivers on the road who haven't driven much for several years. They've lost their alertness because they're out of practice. They don't think or act as quickly in an emergency as they ought to. And there are a lot of new drivers on the road who got their licenses during the war. This is the first time they've really grappled with traffic. 
And finally, every community has a few just plain reckless drivers, smart alecks who can't be trusted behind a wheel. They think it's smart to drive when they've been drinking. They get a thrill out of speed, straddling the center line, passing on hills. They kill themselves, and they kill others. The President of the United States, the National Safety Council, the automobile clubs tell us injuries and deaths will go on mounting unless we take stern measures to get them under control. You may be the next traffic victim, you or someone dear to you. So it's up to you to do your part to end traffic accidents. Check your brakes, check your windshield wiper, check your headlights, and check yourself. And follow the advice of the American Automobile Association. Take it easy. This message is broadcast as a public service by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> And now, our star, Geraldine Fitzgerald, who is currently being starred in the Paramount production, OSS. Thank you. I've been reading a script about a young man called Mordecai Manuel Noah. His story is just as intriguing as his name, and Cavalcade is going to do it next Monday night. I'd like to recommend it to you. It's an exciting play called Algerian Adventure, about Noah's exploits as American consul on the Barbary Coast in 1812. I understand George Murphy is going to star as Noah. And from my reading of the script, I know George will find himself in a lot of exciting situations. I think next week's cavalcade definitely will be something to hear. Thank you, Geraldine, and thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Good night. Music for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. Our Cavalcade play was written by Priscilla Kent. Richard Whitmark played the part of Russ Spencer. Others in the cast included Alan Hewitt, Ed Jerome, Cameron Prudhomme, Lois Boltzmann, Jack Grimes, Jack Manning, and Maurice Franklin. This is Dwight Wiest inviting you to listen next week to Algerian Adventure, starring George Murphy on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs>